about it, what, what, what is this about nuclear war? And why people feel that they need to develop nuclear arsenals? And what can this arsenal do to us? Okay. What are the effects of this, this arsenal? Um, so the reason that countries are stuck in a situation where they feel that they need to have these huge arsenals uh, is because of deterrence. This is a word that you might hear a lot if you are interested in this area. Deterrence means, uh, in Russian, it's just deterrence. Okay. So it's something that to prevent an attack on yourself. So Americans need their nuclear weapons to prevent the Russians from attacking them. Russia need their nuclear weapons because they are afraid that America will attack them. Chinese are worried that both of those will attack them. <laughs> Indians are worried that Pakistani will attack them. Pakistani are worried that, uh, that et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so what can happen in case there is a nuclear war? Just to give you like one example of what we're going to tell you. Remember I mentioned about submarines, that some of these uh, rockets can be launched also from submarines. Well, how much does power, destructive power, does a submarine have? So this is a photo of an actual launch from underwater. The submarine does not even need to research. It can shoot the rocket from underwater, and then the rocket can fly something like 6,000 kilometers to its, uh, to its uh, final destination. So this thing over here, this is not very big, like 10 meters big, okay, has three warheads inside, uh, sorry, sorry, 12 warheads inside. Each one together will add up to 6 million tons of TNT equivalent. Okay, so remember this number, 6 million. Now how, how, much, how much explosives were used during World War II? 3 million. This guy over here carries twice more destructive power than World War II, which killed 50 million people. This is one missile. How many missiles are there on this submarine? It depends on the submarine. The Ohio-class U.S. submarines carry 24 missiles. Okay. So an Ohio-class submarine, of which there's like 20, carries 48 times more destructive power than World War II brought upon ourselves. Okay. Right. Number of the actual deployed weapons, something like 3,000. So the real, so you know, the, one of the main ways in which nuclear weapons kill people, it's not so much about the original initial blast which kills people. It's nuclear fallout that follows. It. There's enormous amount of nuclear radiation which is being produced, which gets dumped on civilian areas, and people simply die from radiation. And that's not all. Like you might ask ourselves, okay, but why do we care about this? You know, telling the saying this is about Russians and Americans. Why would we in Armenia or anywhere else care about these problems that Americans and Russians might kill each other? Well, the thing is that there's a third part of this thing. It's called nuclear winter. When, uh, if, if the uh, weapons are used against cities, that will cause so much smoke that the smoke will go up into the upper atmosphere and cover the planet completely. And will result in the reduction of sunlight by 90 to 99% for as much as 10 years. That means that the temperatures on Earth will drop to something like from by 5 to 20 degrees. And essentially what it means is that no summer for 10 years. No. What does that mean? It means that agriculture will collapse, crops will not grow, livestock will die. It certainly will result in starvation. There will be food will stop growing for, depending on what happens, from 1 to 10 years. And the estimated number of people who die from this is billions. So it doesn't just affect Russians and Americans and Chinese and Indians and Pakistanis and Israelis and North Korean stuff. It affects everyone. Okay? This, this winter is going to kill everyone, not just, uh, not just um, the countries that are fighting each other. So I, I know what you're thinking. You're probably thinking like, did you really come from America to tell us all these scary stories and give all this bad news? You know, in case there's something good about this, of course there is, right? Otherwise I wouldn't be telling this story. But I'll give you one more bad news before after that I'll give you lots of good news. Okay, I promise. So so the term that I mentioned is basically that this concept called mutually assured, assured destruction, where two countries they start a nuclear war, nobody wins, everyone dies. So how many nuclear warheads are there? How many nuclear weapons are there? So this is the history of the number of the nuclear warheads versus time. This is, you know, we start off with the first US bomb that I mentioned that. There's USSR developed its own nuclear weapons. Cuban uh, missile crisis happens, which really brings war very close to nuclear war. So at its maximum, which was in 1985, there were 70,000 nuclear warheads. Okay. Remember what I told you about the submarine? A submarine has 48 times what, uh, has only something like, um, what's it, maybe 200 warheads. And it already, that's already 50 times more than what we suffered during World War II. Okay? This is 70,000. If this stuff would get unleashed on humanity, I mean, people talk about the fact that only insects would survive. Not just humans, other species would you know, go extinct. Okay, so clearly people were extremely worried about this. As things were going so bad, everyone in the world was, you know, people of older generation probably remember how much, you know, there was anxiety about what this is going to cost. Okay? If
if things are stable, okay, but if what if this you know, uh, unstable equilibrium or metastable equilibrium goes really unstable and it takes it to war. So there have been lots of effort to specifically fight against this and convince all the countries to cut down their arsenal. Just as one analogy that I'll use and I'll move on is, was an example that I, I liked a lot, was this, this, this guy who was explaining the situation when we were over here, right? Saying there's, there's a room, and there's two enemies inside the room. And the room is awash with gasoline. There was gasoline air all over, on themselves on the floor. One of them has 20,000 matches, the other one has 30,000 matches, and they are both worried if they have enough matches. That was essentially the state of the logic during, World War, during, during the Cold War, because like, you had so many weapons that would be enough to kill each other off completely. Why make more weapons? So this is what happened afterwards. It was a significant drop off because everyone understood that this is, first of all, unnecessary, but also it makes life extremely dangerous. And there were a couple of things that happened. Historically, that happened when Gorbachev and uh, Reagan finally agreed to cut down things. USSR collapsed in 91. Okay. And then there were a series of treaties that took place that specifically targeted the arsenals. And uh, Americans and Russians mutually agreed to really reduce their stockpiles to much smaller, uh, smaller quantities. And currently, you know, this is there's about a combined uh, deployed arsenal is something like 3,000. So what does deployed mean? Because I use this term, I'm gonna use this term a lot. Deployed means weapons that you can fire at your enemy. So number of weapons is a lot more than the number of weapons that, that you can actually deliver against your enemy. So who has all these weapons? Who are the countries that have most of these weapons? This is like number of weapons for a variety of countries. But essentially, Russia and the United States completely dominate the number of The United States and Russia have 90% of the weapons in the world. Okay? And then there's France, China, UK. And it's a very interesting question. You might ask yourself, why do the Russians and Americans feel they, have, they need so many weapons? And why do French and Chinese and British feel that they don't need so many weapons? It has a lot to do with various kinds of things, uh, various intricacies as to how they feel they would defend themselves against a nuclear war. I won't go into that today. A few words about arms reduction treaties. There have been a number of important treaties that were signed. One of them was non-proliferation treaty, where all these, part, all these countries agreed that they are not going to spread nuclear weapons. Because the idea was that if they give nuclear weapons to another country, there might be short-term benefit, but the long-term uh, kind of dangers are enormous and are just not uh, worth it. Okay. There is this intermediate range nuclear forces treaty, which was quite important to reduce the danger of accidental war that I talked about. And then most importantly, comprehensive test ban treaty was signed in 91, which essentially banned testing of nuclear weapons. The idea was essentially to stop this growth of the, of the, of the, of the nuclear uh, weapons. There have been a number of, uh, you know, the US and Russia have cut down their arsenals from 70,000 to about 15,000. There's been lots of efforts, you know, civilian efforts to really put pressure on governments to really cut down all this, uh, this enormous thing. Now the things that I use the word treaty, okay. What does it take to sign a treaty? Okay. Treaties are a lot about politics, but unfortunately there's also a significant amount of um, technological barriers that prevent from treaties being more ambitious than they could be. Okay. And that has to do with verification. If you want to sign a treaty with somebody, you want to verify that they are doing what they agreed to do. If you are going to you know, if the Americans sign a treaty with the Russians, the Russians are going to reduce their stockpiles by 50%, you want to make sure that Russians are doing that, if you are doing that as well. And Russia should feel the same way, right? But how do you do that? Okay. Apparently, it's a fairly tricky technological question. So the idea of the treaty is you want to have you want this concept of trust but verify, right? The idea of the right? That the Reagan used to... So, okay, so what are the problems with, with treaty verification? Just a couple of words about our group, where I'm working, and then I'll, I'll essentially switch to the te technical part of the, of the talk. Um, you know, we, there's, uh, we have this laboratory for nuclear security policy, which is in the Department of Nuclear Science and Engineering at MIT. There's a number of faculty that work together. We have very different backgrounds. I come from physics. Scott comes from policy. Richard Lanza comes from uh, high energy physics. That comes from nuclear engineering. I have a bunch of students from extremely diverse areas who are all working on a series of problems, and this is one of them that we're working on. Um, so, a couple of, uh, all right, I'll probably skip this. Um, I'll come to this one. Okay, so how do you verify treaties? Now, most treaties, there's two parts to, the, to, your, to your nuclear capability, your ability to strike. One of them is the weapon itself. Second one is the delivery. Delivery um, uh, in Russian is nasitiel, which is a somewhat does not really say what it is, but basically it means the missile that carries the warhead, or the airplane that carries the warhead, or the submarine that carries missile that carries the warhead, or something like that. Those are delivery systems. 
So past treaties have really been focusing on verifying not the reduction of the warheads themselves. That I'll say in a second why. They've been primarily focusing on the number of the delivery systems. The idea being is that if you have only 1,000 delivery systems, if you have 10,000 warheads, all that matter are the first 1,000 warheads. The remaining 9,000 warheads, you cannot use them because you don't have a delivery for them. Right? It's like having a million cartridges and two rifles. There's that many you know, cartridges you can shoot through those things, right? So it was a fairly logical thing to do, and the most of uh, verification focused on the delivery system. And the main reason why they did this is because it is easy, easier, to verify that your op the opposite side is in fact destroying their delivery systems. Why? Because these missiles and these airplanes are fairly large. Okay? It's very hard to cheat the other side. So here's an example of a KGB Soviet operative inspecting an uh, American uh, Griffin uh, intermediate range uh, missile. It's uh, actually, it's, um, it's not that good. It's, it's um, a cruise missile. So he checks that it's a real thing. It's not made out of wood or something like that. And then they watch it being like, broken in pieces. Fantastic. This is a member of the U.S. Congress checking an IC was a Soviet ICBM, seeing that the yeah, IC looks like him, chop it down, great, count, and you count it against you know, towards like, the Soviet Union's or America's you know, um, uh, duties under the treaty. And this is an example in 91 where, as part of the treaty, Americans agreed to destroy 356 B-52 bombers. The B-52 is the equivalent of the 295, it's a strategic bomber which would drop the nuclear bomb on Soviet Union. So they're great, and then how did they verify this? The Americans took these, uh, these uh, airplanes, they took them to the desert, they chopped them down with these giant guillotines, and let them sit in the desert for three months. Soviet satellites, or at this point it was Russian satellites, flew above, they took picture, they said, yes, airplanes have been chopped down, fantastic. So it is possible to do with this. So why not do this with nuclear warheads themselves? There's one problem with this. You're cutting down on delivery system, which is great, but you still are not going after the warheads themselves. You end up having this very large surplus. Yes, you cannot launch the enemy, but you have still have all these extra warheads sitting, which can get stolen, which can lead to nuclear terrorism. They can be taken to another country, which can cause proliferation of nuclear weapons. That such are a big danger, even though there's no delivery system associated with them. Okay. The trouble with that is that authenticating an airplane is fairly